everyone. Welcome again to uh, Arai News Live. Uh, again, I'm your host, Brian. I uh, appreciate you guys spending some time with us. Uh, this is our fourth uh, video. We're experimenting with our timing and we're back to the mornings because we think more of you are watching in the morning. Uh, we're splitting our uh, broadcast today between YouTube and Facebook. Hopefully we'll engage more of an audience. And we do appreciate you coming and spending time with us. Uh, this uh, live stream <clears throat> is a compliment to our uh, digital uh, email uh, uh, Arai News newsletter that we send out every month. And here we're doing more of a uh, organic kind of conversational with some guests now and again, some technical, uh, some informational, uh, based on feedback from customers, questions that are asked in general that we think a lot of you would uh, like to hear or know more about. So this is our uh, fourth installation. And uh, this video, we were going to try to do another live uh, in the studio, bring someone uh, on as a guest. But as we all know, uh, there's a little bit more intense uh, restrictions on, you know, proximity to others. So we had to call that live uh, effort off and we're doing it uh, via Zoom. And uh, this week's guest or this month's guest is Greg White. Greg White was a racer uh, back in the day and Arai, longtime sponsored guy, and moved on into broadcasting. So whereas I am an absolute amateur, Greg has quite a bit of professionalism, uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll rub off a little bit on me. So I'd like to uh, invite and welcome Greg uh, to the show. Greg, you there? All right. oh, yeah, yeah, I'm here, Brian. Hold on, I'm on a heater. I'm playing mad skills. I got to beat Jason Pridmore. <laughs> That's how professional I am. What's up, dude? Good to see you. It's good Bummed to see you. I'm sitting at home and not in the studio with you, but totally, totally get it. Yeah, Happy to yeah. be here. Yeah, that's cool. And, and you were going to drive up north from North Carolina, but lucky for you, uh, you didn't because it's, what, 60-something there and it's 40-something here? Yeah, I mean, when we get off, it's going to be about 65 degrees, I think, today. So it's perfect for a motorcycle ride. I was going to say, you get to go ride. I get to go uh, freeze my, my you-know-what's off when I go outside and nice. do anything. <laughs> But, yeah. um, but no, we do appreciate you taking the time and, and hooking up with us. Uh, you guys might recognize Greg's setup. Uh, he does a live uh, podcast weekly uh, from his studio, so we're listening to him. And of course, his audio, his studio is a little more professional than ours. But uh, again, <laughs> we're learning. So. Well, I mean, this is kind of stuck in the corner of my <laughs> office. And so I try to, you know, soundproof a little bit because I have these big vaulted ceilings and the audio kind of bounces around. But Yep. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing broadcast for a little while, Brian. I mean, I think this is year, I mean, do I really want to say it? Year 23, yeah. heading into year 24 for me of doing TV, broadcast, all that stuff. Cool. I was going to say, we, we are going to work on our audio as well. I know there's some uh, echo. We're actually in the warehouse. We've made a little studio in our warehouse. We're working on audio and, and, and color and quality so we're getting better um and we appreciate it but by the way that warehouse is one of my favorite places because you guys got a lot of helmets and bits and pieces and parts in that yeah. warehouse i mean where'd you find room to do it i love the setup i mean yeah. obviously i'm trying to look into the camera but at the same time <laughs> on this feed i have you down below so if i look kind of weird it's because i like to check out some of the stuff you guys have laying around I, I brought out some helmets myself maybe we'll tell some stories about some of these cool helmets over the years but yeah, uh, yeah. I like you guys set up back there. No, it, it, it is very cool. We, we try and, uh, I mean, the office is basically parts and accessories service uh, marketing for Arrive in North South America. But we kind of used an old show display and, and walled off a little meeting room. It was originally a meeting room when people came to visit when people used to be able to visit. Uh, and we just kind of kept taking more and more space. We set up dealer display potentials, you know, you know showing what dealers could display, rolling racks, walls some cool graphics, got some carpet to make it a little more uh, agreeable, I guess not so warehousey, if you will. Mm -hmm. But the ceilings are still pretty high and echoey, gotta turn the heat off, gotta turn the, the fans off, keep all the guys out of the back. But, uh, but yeah, we kind of turned it from a meeting room into a studio and we're encroaching more and more on it and it's pretty much all studio now. Uh, we have a green screen we play with now and again. We won't use it today, but it is cool and we do have a, a lot of uh, examples of what a ride does best and that's you know protect riders and there's a lot of crash damage a lot of cool memories a lot of vintage stuff that we don't have on display since we just don't have the space for it so it is cool that you put some of your helmets up and i also tend to look away because the tv's over there and the the, the, uh, the camera's there so if i look away i'm not losing attention i'm just trying to get you know uh, some information or, or a, a, a cue of what greg's talking about so let's talk about 
you know, you, you've been in broadcasting over 20 years. Before that, you know, we actually were, were sponsors of you when you used to race. Give us uh, some, some history on your racing. Yeah, so I, I started, um, well, first of all, I wasn't allowed to ride a motorcycle as a kid. My, my mom hates motorcycles. My dad, you know, crashed on his way into Boston one time in the middle of the winter, you know, to go to work. He was a carpenter, a uh, um, union carpenter back in the day, and he crashed and had a rod in his leg. So she was like, motorcycles are dangerous. So I, I didn't get to ride a motorcycle for the first time until I was 18 in college and got hooked immediately and found out about racing soon after that. So the, my story is, is interesting. I ran into a guy um, in 1994 who I went to college with. I had gra just graduated from college, and I went to the, the MotoGP race, or actually the 500 GP race at Laguna, and ran into a guy who was racing AMA Nationals. And the very next weekend, they were coming to Road Atlanta, which was only about six hours from my house. And I just bought a Kawasaki ZX6 E model. So I went down to the race in 94 and ended up watching racing from inside the pits and thought, wow, I want to try this. So that was the year that Kawasaki launched. The very next year is when Kawasaki launched the new ZX6R model that we know and love now. It's the first iteration of it. I went to Roebling Road Raceway in February of 1995 at an Ed Bargy school, took the school, passed, and then started racing. And I raced in Weira in 95. And again in 96 as a novice or a yellow plate and uh, was lucky enough to win a couple national championships in 1996 because we were used to have a program called the Weira National Challenge. And we legitimately went around the country and raced at racetracks as a novice along with all the expert racers. And, you know, the names like during 1996 season, I roomed like every weekend with Josh Hayes, who's, of course, a longtime Mariah guy and everything else. Mm -hmm. And they're the. Jamie Hacking came out of that series. There's a bunch of riders that came out of that series. But by that time, I was already an old man, Brian. I mean, I was, you know, 24 or something like that and didn't have a lot of experience. So I decided like a moron that I was just going to go straight to AMA Pro Racing in 1997. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did. I went and um, started that career. And the thing that helped me the most was 1997, I... I moved to Atlanta in 1996 and I met the producers at Chet Burke's Productions who were producing all the motorcycle racing at the time. And at Pikes Peak in 1997, I actually started with the help of Arai, I must say. I wish I had that original helmet, but I actually started to do an onboard camera and microphone. So on my bike was a, was a camera that would face uh, out of the front like the windscreen. And then I had a microphone that was tucked in my helmet and the way a ride fits for me, there's very little space between my chin and, and you know, the chin guard of the helmet. But there was enough room to put a microphone in there. And I had an earpiece in while I raced. I could hear the commentary and they would toss to me on the racetrack for comments live while I was on the racetrack. And I did that 97 through 2001 kind of full time. Mm -hmm. And then I had one off rides in 03. Uh, as a factory Yamaha rider, 07 as a factory Suzuki rider. And and since 1996 is when I've been with, with Arai. And I started as a customer. And then I think because of the TV exposure and racing nationals, I was able to get a, on a, a Arai support program. And I, you know, I had Two Wheel Tuesday for three and a half years, a TV show. So there were occasions when I would try other, you know, other brands of helmets and there's no way, man. I just kept coming back to Arai. Uh, that's what we'd like to hear. Now, I, I got to ask, how, how does having those guys in your ear while you're racing and then, then you know, and you can almost drown that out, but when they throw a question to you, doesn't that mess with you and your concentration? Yeah, the first time, um, the producer who came up with the idea is actually the, the same guy who produces the Supercross and Motocross series now, a mm -hmm. guy named Chris Bond. And the first time he came to me was in a 750 Super Sport race. I was on a Suzuki 600. And it was a wet, dry track. It was very intense to ride on it. And we didn't have rain tires back in the day. We had to race on DOT tires, rain or shine or whatever. And I remember uh, the way Pikes Peak was, Brian, it was like a pretty short track. I think the lap times were in, they were in like the the mid 50 seconds, like 55 seconds, 57 seconds, 52 or threes for super bikes. And when they came to me, they're like, let's go to Greg on, you know, on the track. 
I was breaking into an M section. Like it was like left, right, left, and then out you go. And I had to start talking. So I nearly wadded myself up, dude. I mean, I get on the brakes and I'm like, ah, and I go sideways, whatever. And I say what I had to say, but I lost like one and a half seconds that lap. <laughs> so I come on the banking and I'm yelling at the producer, you know, and he had to turn me down because he's listening to engine and wind noise the whole time. And so he turns me down. So I'm yelling at him, Bondo, 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 Bondo. And he's like, finally, what? I'm like, can you come to me on the straightaway, please? <laughs> like that was gnarly. And he was like, all right, I'll try to figure it out. But um, generally, when I did it at places like Laguna, Road America, it would slow me down about a second to a second and a half per lap because you've got to take all your attention away from, you know, from riding. And But it wasn't dangerous, but it definitely wasn't the fast way around talking. However, with that said, it allowed me to go racing. Because the, the camera was shooting through the windscreen, I was allowed during those days of speed vision and then in the early days of Speed Channel to put stickers on the windscreen. So I had like a Dunlop sticker and a Suzuki sticker. So I was able to get a couple sets of tires and Suzuki was lending me a bike for the year. So it, it was my way of being able to go racing on a tight budget. Right. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And it, and it kind of led into your broadcast, you know, uh, career. It, it certainly forward. did. The, the relationship between the guys at Chet Burke's Productions down in Atlanta and the relationships that I developed because I was a racer uh, turned into a full-time job. And I worked there for four years intensely as a producer, on camera, writing teases. I produced the uh, MotoGP and World Superbike races for the United States. So we would take in satellite feeds of the production. We cut it up for commercials. I would write and voice and edit all the teases. So I, I really got my foundation in television there. And that kind of led into, hey, listen, um, Larry Myers can't be here for this race. Can you pit report instead of racing? Blah, 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 blah. And then when Speed Channel finally took over in 2002, the question was posed to me like, hey, do you want to race full time or do you want to be a commentator? And, you know, I was spending a lot of money going racing. And uh, at that time, I'd only had two top 10 finishes. So I kind of knew there was no factory rider on the horizon. So I decided to just do commentating, you know, just to be a commentator and learn as much as I could. And here we are all these years later and I'm lucky enough to still be in the sport. I was going to say that's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of racers have to try and figure out what they're going to do after racing and you kind of stepped right into your next thing and you stayed in racing and you're still pretty much right involved in it every almost every day. Yeah, I mean you have to be now especially with social media and everything else. I mean it's a lot of my job is working the phones, uh, text messages, which actually helps a lot, you know, getting information quickly via text not having to be on the phone with people for two or three hours at a time getting information. But um, I have some valuable assets, some really, I mean, the, the, the paddock itself, the Moto America paddock and the management at Moto America are very friendly people. Everybody wants to give out information, get more fans, you know, engaged in the sport. And it's really proven to be a good thing because the last couple of years, especially this year, we've seen tremendous growth on the, TV side, on the social media side, and the conversation around Moto America is getting a lot stronger. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a great thing. I mean, for, for quite a while, road racing in America was kind of just, you know, kind of teetering, and it seems to have come back, and they're doing a, you know, it took them a while to get their, their footing and get momentum, but it seems to be coming back. And then this year, they did a, a what might have been considered a publicity stunt, but it seemed to have gotten a lot of attention and maybe revitalize some interest in, in Moto America and, and racing. Yeah, I think um, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the tragedy surrounded by that has definitely had some positive effects on some businesses, some people, uh, where most of it's really, really bad. But when it comes to Moto America, because of the nature of the sport itself, being an outside activity, uh, having counties, racetracks that were interested in getting something going early and the fact that there wasn't a lot of sports that were going um, we were able to jump from Fox Sports 2 to Fox Sports 1 which increased the exposure and to start getting racing done earlier than a lot of people and it's been really uh, good because at the beginning a lot of the race teams were, were diligent about making sure that we were following all the rules of social distancing um, 
it was pods. We were in pods. So like if you had your own pod, you were allowed to not wear your mask, but anything outside of your pod. So my pod was the broadcast booth with Jason Pridmore. So if I wasn't in that booth with Jason Pridmore, I had to have my mask on and, you know, there were the hand washing stations, all that kind of stuff. So I think I think with the planning that Moto America had, the execution that Moto America had, along with Supercross, you know, right at the time, we were able to get on early and there wasn't a lot of content on there. And I think that really helped show people uh, how great the sport of motorcycle road racing is and how dialed in Moto America was. Plus, there were some changes on the director seat this year for us TV wise mm -hmm. and that that freed up uh, our ability to communicate in a little bit of a different way and have more of an impact from the booth as well as the producers on the way the broadcast was. And I think that that really played. Now, what, what went against us, Brian, honestly, was there's this dude, um, Cameron... Bobby something, Bobier, number one play. <laughs> this dude won 16 to 20 races. I think he averaged, I don't even know. I've got to go back and do the math, like uh, six, seven seconds per race win. So in terms of the racing up front, it was a little bit more difficult to commentate than normal. Mm -hmm. But it's been great because I'm sure this has happened to you guys too. People are finding motorcycling again, which is great. But also that means that my phone's starting to ring off the hook of people like, hey, man, can you get me some tickets to the races? I saw you on Fox Sports 1. <laughs> You know, that type of thing. So all those things are positive. Oh, plus, you know, the hate that I get online about my commentating, that's increased quite a bit too, which is another good sign that people are watching. It's, it's well, that's, as long as we're commenting, good or bad, it, it's, it's engaging and it's, you know, you know, keeping people interested. So that's a good thing. And it's bumping up the numbers. So that's always positive. But yeah, um, but yeah I mean, motorcycling is a great social distancing sport. Put your helmet on, go for a ride. I mean, it's really advantageous uh for our sport and it's picked up quite a bit in the in the the interim that that little eye of the storm of covid you know everyone came kind of out of hibernation went and bought a bunch of off-road bikes and went riding and it was incredible now we're kind of going into lockdown again but luckily for in the northeast it's getting into winter so we were going to go quiet anyway but it is great that the sport <laughs> seems to have been revitalized um which is great people are recognizing that and engaging with their kids that's another thing you know as a father of six, engaging with our kids on a daily basis, you know, it's daunting. Um, but to be able to go wait, out and wait, do wait, something. Wait, 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 You're a father of six? Father of six. I always like to throw that in whenever Bravo, I can. <laughs> wow. Well, my running joke is that I hide at work while my wife has six full-time jobs at home. So it's... Uh, it's true. She's but my your hero. motorcycle gas bill must be outrageous. Well, no, Poor unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean... I wasn't allowed to, well, my father was into motorcycling and I had a bike when I was a young kid, but my mom didn't like it. Uh, and as I got somewhat mm -hmm. older and got a little more risky -er with motorcycling, they really frowned upon it. So at 18, I went out and bought a dirt bike, an 85 XR 350, a, a, a Nighthawk 700, unbeknownst to my parents, and hid them at my friend's garage for probably the better part of a year before I let them know that I had a motorcycle. Um, so my son's in the same boat. Uh, he wants a motorcycle. Yeah. My wife fought it. Uh, and now he just wheels and deals. He trades and, and he just keeps stepping up and making money on motorcycle trades and goes out riding with his buddies, fixes bikes. It's great. I mean, he did it mostly on his own because, you know, I kind of had a, you know, hey, shh, don't tell mom. Just go and do, go do it, whatever, you know. And he's been pretty good about it. Hasn't crashed too hard. So uh, I can't, I can't fault him for wanting to do it because it is a lot of fun. Um, so... Well, where you guys are in Pennsylvania, too, you actually have some incredible places to ride, like off-road, you know, because, like, for, from a dirt bike perspective, I'm not much of a motocross guy. Like, you know, it, it, like, if you go to the vet track at Elsinore, it takes me probably the full day before I can jump all the jumps. And, it, like, <laughs> in moto, tabletops are my friends. So when I come to the dirt, I like to ride off-road. And there are some incredible places to ride <laughs> within probably, what, maybe two hours of where you guys are located. So it's a it, it's it's an awesome place. Plus, you can go down to Hatfield McCoy Trail System in West Virginia. I mean, you guys are in a really good spot. But you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about too, Brian, is I was just kind of thinking about this when we talk about racing and the years I spent with Arai. You know, I I've been lucky enough to be. I don't want to say I'm a journalist because I'm not a journalist. I don't have a journalism degree. I haven't taken the oath and all that stuff. I know I'm more of an entertainer, but when it came to the early days of my television career, I used to work on a show called Bike Week that was hosted originally by Larry Myers, then Dave Spain. I worked on a show called Motorcyclist with the magazine and the entire umbrella of magazines that were under that. And then I had my own show for three and a half years called Two Wheel Tuesday. So I was involved in a lot of 
press releases and traveling the world and getting to ride motorcycles. And one of the things that that I love best about like my Arai helmets was the fact that it didn't matter like if it was a race application or a street application, it was it was the same helmet. It was the same helmet that I would use for both applications and it was familiar, it felt the same. It wasn't like this was a special helmet that was designed for racing and you get better protection because it's higher speeds. It was always the security of having the same helmet, the same shell, maybe different paint job, but also the fact that I knew other manufacturers uh, would make special one-off helmets for their racers. And I've seen guys like over the years, like Colin Edwards and Nikki Hayden, literally unbox an Arai helmet, put it on and go out and race Grand Prix racing. And it's like that to me spoke tremendous volumes about the product because it was familiar once I got my fit dialed in. Because obviously, I mean, as you know, Brian, I mean, the adjustability on an Arai helmet's great with the foam layers and all the things that you can do to customize it. Uh, you know, it's easy to clean. And I spent years on a racetrack working, uh, riding at Jason Pridmore Star School and out at Chuck Walla Valley Raceway in the desert. You want to talk about sweat, 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 and you can just pop off the liner, wash it. Once it's set, it's set. So I love that about my Arai helmets, you know, that they were always like whoever was the star in an Arai helmet in GP, I knew I was getting the exact same helmet and the exact same protection. And that was one thing that was comforting for me because if I had a race helmet and I needed to go on a street ride, it made no difference. I just put it on and go. You know, my, my street helmets might be customized a little bit from the perspective of communication devices. Like this helmet right here uh, is my, <laughs> my Scootin' USA helmet, all right? So this one was back in the Speed Channel days. It was back during Two Wheel Tuesday. And you can see the old G-Dub nickname. Uh, this one's painted up by Offbeat Productions, uh, as most of my helmets were. It's got a beautiful landscape, you can see, because we were we took Zuma scooters, 50cc, well, 49cc Zuma scooters across the United States. So from Charlotte to California and some stops in between. And that was the old Scoot in USA. And so this still actually has uh communication devices that are that are inside that we use to communicate so beyond that you know all my helmets are exactly the same with the exception of my visors and yes brian you need to talk about visors because number one people don't know about them you know like in terms of like the different shades you can get but for me <laughs> man i don't like smoke visors i want clear as as i can be even in the bright sunlight i don't need sunglasses it's really weird for me I like to have clear all the time. It drives Jeff Jeff Wheel, your technical guy, crazy because I keep asking him, "When are you guys bringing back the yellow, the yellow visor?" You know, and I know that it's an FIM requirement that no one have it anymore because of the color of lights or something like that. But I'm telling you, man, it, people kind of they when you ask them what visor you use, do you like a medium tint, a light tint, a dark tint? They don't know because they're unaware. So why don't you tell us about just the different visors and stuff that are available for these helmets. Nah, it's, over the years we've come up with many, many options. You, make, you mentioned the yellow, which is high def. It actually does uh, brighten up details and it kind of uh, you know, brightens up shadows and makes it a little bit more visible. But the amazing thing is even though yellow seems to brighten or enhance light, it actually does diminish your field of view. I wrote a yellow shield at night once by accident and didn't realize how much light it actually cut out and it was difficult to see mm -hmm. at night. So it's one of those things where it's very specific, very purposeful. It's not for everybody in every situation. And we played with amber, which is darker, um, which has a different type of high def uh, functionality. We have light tint, medium light tint, dark smoke, clear, of course. And it's funny you mentioned clear. A lot of top MotoGP and uh, top AMA back in the day, they all were clear in the brightest of sun. And they, they, they regulated in uh, light intake by just how much they open their eyes. Uh, and it's amazing how I learned a long time ago that if you squint, you, you, you struggle and you, you use your face muscles and you actually get you know cramps and your eyes get tired uh, and it's difficult uh, to do that. So if you ever watch a top end racer, uh, and I specifically remember Freddie Spencer and someone had made a comment about his sleepy look. And as he's racing, and he makes it look effortless when he's racing, and you see through his perfectly clear shield, he's going to a corner in super bright sun, and he's just kind of like, 
just kind of has his eyes half closed. And it's not because he's sleepy. It's not because we caught him mid-blink. It's because he's metering the amount of light that's getting into his eyes. But he never liked smoke or light tint because it was too restrictive. It took away too much of his field of view. So he liked to do it himself. So a lot of racers like yourself like to clear shields. But some, like myself, very sensitive, I wear dark all the time. But over the years, we've played with options. So within our dark and light smoke shields, we now have a new pink high definition uh, film that's laminated to the inside of the shield that offers some high def functionality on top of a light uh, metering smoke or light tint. And then with that, we can add anti-fog. So if you're a heavy breather, you sweat a lot and your shields tend to fog, you can fight uh, fog without going uh, overboard with dual paint shields or uh, fog sticks or having to deal with fog. So we have, you know, I think 12 shield options at this point. Anti-fog, non-anti-fog, tint, light, high definition, dark smoke, dual paint for extreme weather. If you're riding in a monsoon, we have a dual paint anti-fog shield that will pretty much cover it for a certain period of time. Uh, you know, if you ride for too long, any shield's gonna get overwhelmed. But Arise always looked at how we can improve the ride and improve rider safety by basically keeping your, your field of vision as clear as possible, as long as possible. And in that vein, back in the day when Arai was really heavy into racing, where we cut our teeth in developing our helmets, we used racing to develop our helmets. We learned the different shapes of heads around the world racing. Uh, we came to America, we realized our heads are a different shape than the uh, Asian riders and European riders. So we had to develop a head shape for the US market that allowed a ride to get the most comfortable fit and we're still recognized as the most comfortable helmet um, once you get your right, your right fit package. And then we also realized that while racing is extreme, high speeds, um, all the races are going in the same direction. They're all professionals paying attention, watching out for themselves and each other. They have runoff, they have ambulances at the ready um, it's a fairly safe environment. Someone out on the road, having people go different directions, not paying attention, cross traffic with just a yellow line separating you, trucks, distracted drivers, and now we have texting drivers. I realized right away, the consumer on the street needs as much, if not more protection than a racer. So at that point, I decided we're making one helmet. One helmet for everyone. The, the, the consumer on the street gets the best protection they possibly can because Honestly, they need it as much, if not more, than the racer. So, like you said, we've had racers pull an Araya out of the retail box. We've actually had racers win Daytona. I think it was Kevin Schwantz. Uh, he crashed and messed, it, messed up his last racing helmet. And at the time, we had a replica for him. And one of our distributors had a warehouse in Jacksonville. And we actually had a helmet overnighter from their inventory in his replica shipped to Daytona, and he wore that production helmet from a warehouse that you could have bought on the street the next day and he won Daytona in that helmet. So it was really cool that exact same helmet in his graphic and nobody was for the wiser. So that was an awesome example of what a ride does differently than everyone else. And back in the day there were a lot of special helmets from other manufacturers. I can't mm -hmm. speak to that today. I don't know how many people if anyone still does that but I can tell you straight up that a ride races out of the box 100%. The only thing we might tweak is a little custom fitting, like you said, to address a hair change. Um, you know, when you used to race, you had hair. Then you, 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 choose, you chose to <laughs> remove that. And then, of course, I'm, I'm sure affected your fit at that point. Um, so we have to address those things um, on a case-by-case -case basis. But for the most part, most of our racers now fit a box stock helmet. If you're a medium size, you're going to wear a medium helmet. Uh, and mm -hmm. there are some racers that have an odd shape. I've got a flat spot in the back of my head. I have to deal with a point as well, a square forehead. So I have to tweak mine. I'm a long oval. I tweak it a little bit, but for the most mm -hmm. part, 70 to 80% of racers and riders you know, wear them right out of the box. Uh, so it's, it's quite remarkable how far we've come using racing as a tool of development and how it applies to the street. Yeah, the other thing too is, is that I noticed over the years was that it's not a distracting helmet from the sense that the you know where your vision for the the hole the eye hole itself is just it seems to be over the years the benchmark how other people are looking at helmets to develop helmets because you talked about daytona and i raced daytona several times on fast bikes and on not so fast bikes like a bmw boxer cup bike it's really funny when i did the bmw boxer cup class which is a spec class 
these you know bmw i think they're like 1100s or something you know with the boxer engines with that stuff sticking out the side the fastest that would go on the banking with me is 143 or 145 mile per hour it's so slow like when you say that to a normal person you're like 145 miles an hour is slow when you're on the banking of daytona and you can look far down the track because obviously the further you look down the track the slower the sensation of speed it's a it's a common mistake with new riders they tend to try to because they're nervous they look at the front wheel but it's like if you lift your eyes up and look down the road a bit it's going to slow everything down for you so at daytona bouncing around the banking the old banking before they paved it and going 143 miles per hour and getting drafted by 120 pound guys you had a lot of time to look around and to really you know see and one of the things that was a benefit is the fact that I could see uh, peripherally and and move my eyes, and I didn't have to turn my head to look, and it was always something that I that I noticed and I loved. But it really would show itself if I would put on a different type of helmet, and you didn't have as much room to look around. You would have to actually physically move your head. It doesn't sound like much, but that little attention to detail, um, you know, w- would affect the way you race because you know keeping your eyes forward is really important. And the speed of which you can move your eyes versus even the head movement in milliseconds made a huge difference. So yeah, I mean my my experience with the rise has been great. You want to talk about crashes though? Here, here's another <laughs> one. I gotta tell you a story. So this helmet was when I kind of first started doing television, and I can't remember what year this would have been. Maybe 1998 or something. And Offbeat Productions made this, and it's obviously a mr clean with a microphone and i thought wow this is awesome and i knew it was coming and it got shipped to mid ohio at a racetrack yeah or or during a race weekend and i pulled this thing out of the box as proud as i could it was one of my first custom painted helmets ever and it was a big deal back then and i thought the job he did was phenomenal we did worry a little bit about copyright infringement but anyway i take it out of the box i go straight out for qualifying and it was drying track, there was mud on the track, and no sooner do I try to avoid someone in qualifying, and I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can see yeah. that. Yeah, a little road rash. Lamo. A little bit, yeah, it was a big impact. Like, it was one of those impacts where I, where next thing you know, I'm down. I didn't even realize I was down, and it the hit, my head took a hit, and it was like, did I leave the iron on? And then I remember start tumbling, you know? <laughs> but I've had some big doozies, man, over the yeah. years in awry helmets and i've been very fortunate to say that i've never been never been knocked out before Mm. in my life in in the crashes that i've had but that one was more depressing than anything because i think i was actually in that helmet for about 17 minutes and then it was over (laughs) and it's been on my shelf ever since and i absolutely adore that helmet it is but it's just it's a testament to like you know when that happens and you see it's really just scraping paint off and the shell integrity is still there and you know, there's no cracking or anything else. I mean, there's just incidents that I've had in my life where I've just been sold, convinced. Yeah. You know, and why would I want anything different on the street? You know, that's why. Or moto. You yeah. know. So. Well, that's the thing. I mean, anyway. a ride was so developed back um, way back then. We had the shell strength so high that we could get a wider peripheral vision, a wider eye hole, as you say, technically, uh, technical term. Uh, so we had a really <laughs> what you call it the eye port <laughs> a vision port it's a port. i don't know it's an eye port but basically we had the, a field of view that no one had and everyone chased and it's getting much better these days everyone has been able to i guess step up and get up to that level but i'm not sure if anyone has a wider peripheral view than awry and while you've never been knocked out that's awesome knock on a plastic table yeah. under this you know it's no guarantee i mean there are impacts that can overwhelm anything but it, the whole idea is to try and design something for the the, the unpredictable and hopefully do the best in any scenario. So high speed impact glancing impacts is where we really look to do better. Being able to, to skip off that ground, avoid the energy so you can get up and shut your iron off, if you will. Um, but it does it does stink that you had a brand new helmet, look, looked awesome and then 17 minutes in, it had to do its job, but it did its job and that's the most important part. Now you got a cool trophy to tell lies about uh, on, on the shelf there. Um, yeah, I was getting ready to set pole. Did yeah, I mention that? I was I, just getting ready to set pole I, position, I think. I thought you did But it's hard to say. I thought it was right Memory's after the Memory's a little line. fuzzy after yeah. that. <laughs> no, that's awesome. But, no, uh, one, no one believes that. No, there's no <laughs> one. If you listen to our podcast, which is the Greg's Garage 
pod with co-host Jason Pridmore, which is available like everywhere, you know, Apple, you know, Spotify, all that stuff. If you listen to it, it's just nonstop of Jason crushing me. <laughs> you, know, you used to be a, you know, you used to be a rider, not a racer and all this, you know, you would think that when I raced AMA pro racing, that every time I made the grid was a provisional, like I actually didn't <laughs> qualify. But the truth is we didn't have provisionals back then. They, they didn't have that. There were a lot of things that were different back in the day for sure. Yep. You know, but no. what are you going to do? That's awesome. So Brian, this is what I want to know. All right. So I have some questions for you about a ride because I think it was what, See, it was during Jersey, I think, 2019. So it would have been September 2019. I think you took a caravan of of people, uh, of journalists, over to Japan, for, yeah. you know, to get to... Was that... That was last year, wasn't it? I think so. It all blurs together. Yeah, last year. <laughs> um, you know, since I didn't get to go, you know, I'm not saying whether I got invited or not, but it just happened to be scheduled on a Moto America race weekend, you know, so I couldn't uh. attend. But it sure looked good. I mean, I saw tons of video coming out, you know, coming out of Arai um, that different journalists were doing, and that the trip looked phenomenal. But what I want to know is, because I, I I don't think this is the one thing. The shells or the helmets themselves are hand built, are they not? Like there isn't really any automation at all I, with those a, helmets. Yeah. The, the, there's a couple of we have a laser cutting machine, um, and we have some machines that help with the process of finishing, um, but. 95 to 98 percent of the helmets are built by hand and how long does it take like if from from stem to stern how long does it take to to get a helmet from the beginning of production until it's in a box and ready to roll generally yeah depending on how efficient like if we have everything lined up it takes several days um paint process the paint process actually takes two to three days on its own because we have to prep the shells uh paint sand paint sand paint sand and there's uh, drying times in between so paint can take two to three days depending on how complicated the paint or the graphics are then a final mm -hmm. assembly and, and the um the, the process of of attaching everything and uh, quality control and all that so it could take i'm going to say the better part of a of a work week to get a helmet actually said you know start to finish and what about um r d development because obviously we know the shells are incredible they have been for many years so a lot of the R and D seems to be what on shape, on ventilation, or is it still evolving? Like, what can you tell us about the future, Brian, of Arai? Like, what's in the hopper? Can you tell us some trade secrets at this point? <laughs> um, they keep me in the dark a lot because I like to talk, and they're yeah. afraid I might talk. But um, <laughs> yeah, but no. I, dude, I totally get that. Same, <laughs> same, same. Right here, yeah, it's, it's amazing we're, we're even get, letting in, anyone get anything in here on the outside. But um, no, basically, Arai is is so fundamentally um, fixated on round, strong, and smooth. The helmet's got to be round, strong, and smooth to deal with the reality of you know, hitting the ground, sliding, skipping, and bouncing. So that will never change. You know, we evolved from a fairly round shape to an, an egg shape. You know, as we developed our shells, they actually evolved into egg, and an egg is the strongest shape in nature. Uh, and we kind of learned that the hard way and finally realized after decades of research, wow, our, egg, our helmets look kind of like egg shape. You'd think somebody would have put mm -hmm. that together and figured it out sooner, but we evolved into that for strength. And everything else we do is to enhance ventilation, comfort, fit, aerodynamics, all those things. And it's really hard to do that without messing up that fundamental shape, keeping that egg shape for strength and impact performance. So R&D is, one, always trying to make a better shell thinner stronger lighter and perform better uh, and those kind of things are really hidden you can't really see the evolution of awry we're constantly evolving our helmets but they really don't look any different but they do perform better even if minutely so we're always chasing that even just a little bit is going to have some impact on a positive note for the rider we're hoping uh, and then we of course improve ventilation to where it doesn't add weight doesn't add any negative effect to the helmet in an impact. All our vents are frangible. They break away. They crush. They need to disappear in an impact so that the helmet can perform like it's supposed to. Comfort is a huge thing. Who wants to be uncomfortable? You know, you want to enhance the ride. You want people to want to ride longer. We have racers come off a track after a full-blown race event and do an interview with his helmet on. He doesn't need to take it off. He doesn't want to take it off. He's not itching to take it off. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, and then so you, hey, got, you got guys put microphones underneath trying to hear them. It's kind of awkward probably for you guys. But, uh, it's, but it, uh, to, to me, I like that. So, you know, it's kind of like that. 
you're going more for that raw motion, I think. You know, right. when someone gets off the track, and oftentimes, you know, you you want to make racing professional and all this kind of stuff. And if you look at MotoGP, you know, they 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 give the riders time to kind of calm down, celebrate with their teams, and all that's great. I have been a fan over the years of being in pit lane, having the rider roll in, helmet on, all that stuff, the excitement and getting that energy. No one else has been able to speak with them. I mean, in the years that I was a pit reporter, Brian, honestly, I mean, there were so many moments I think about where, you know, somebody has had their first win or, you know, some some first podium or something milestone-y in their life. And I'm the first person who gets to speak with them and ask them a question about their experience. And and there's been times when um, I've been in the booth and something happens and I wasn't down there to do that. And I think about that. One of them is like Tommy Hayden's first superbike win. I wasn't pit reporting when that happened. And I thought, wow, it would have been really neat to talk to Tommy Hayden, you know, about about his win. So um, I don't mind that at all. But you want to talk about comfort. What's the new helmet? The Defiant X? Is that the is that one of the newer helmets? It's like, one of the newer ones. It's with, the, with the new liner? Well, in it, like the, what is that material? That well, thing is. We we have a bunch of different liner materials. We have an Eco Pure, which basically is antimicrobial. It kind of keeps helmet fresher longer. It doesn't let bad things develop in helmets because a lot of people unfortunately don't clean their helmets as often as they should. Um, we have a uh, dry cool liner, which fabric wicks moisture and heat away from your head. It's incredibly comfortable. I actually find it cold. It actually pulls so much heat off my head. I get cold inside. But the new Region mm -hmm. X. Uh, the new Region X is a... Region X, Region X, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, That's it, what it adds to this new one. It employs a, a, a brushed nylon, so it's that really soft fabric that is just like putting a pillow on your head. It's so incredibly comfortable. Um, now, depending on how you ride or where you ride, in, in, if, you're, if you're working really hard and you're in a hot climate, it's going to be a little bit warmer, but it's so comfortable. I actually found that it was so comfortable and actually cool in that press um, junket we did to Japan last year. It was both a come see the factory and how we do things differently and the difference of our eye. And also an introduction to the Region X. That was its first introduction. And we did a two day ride in Japan and the first day up through the countryside up to a, a hotel in the mountains. It was pretty humid and warm. Um, so we, we, we tested the ventilation and well, I got you know, warm. I never got sweaty or, or, or hot. Uh, so it was actually mm -hmm. quite remarkable. And then on the way back, we, we basically rode through a monsoon. Uh, there was a typhoon circling the, the coast and we got dumped on and we rode the last half of the uh, trip back in a downpour in the city. And the helmet didn't leak, didn't get wet, shields didn't fog. Uh, it was just incredible. And the ventilation kept the humidity down so we didn't fog and we didn't have anti-fog shields. So it was remarkable how comfortable and how well it worked, even though you might want to say it wasn't tuned or designed for anything extreme. So I was really impressed with the, a very basic helmet for the every guy or the everyday ride performed extremely well. So I have a lot of praise for that helmet. Uh, some, some consider it almost like an entry level helmet, uh, but it has all the bells and whistles other helmets have, full ventilation. Same eye port, same shell, yeah. same protection as even our Corsair, because again, on the street, whether you wear a Corsair or the Regent, you get the same level of protection. So it is a, an awesome example of the latest greatest from Mirai, but it's not our flagship helmet. It's got incredible performance, but it's not the most expensive or the flagship. It's just another Mirai that we wanted to bring out for, you know, uh, people who may not be doing racing or high speed or touring. You know, you could be commuting in that helmet and you'd be super happy. So comfortable, especially with a bald head and 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 my and my chubby cheeks that I didn't have when I raced. It is, yeah, it's 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 a great helmet. So, do we have uh, do we have any questions? Do we know that we we have a question rolling in or what? Where's Jeff? Isn't he around there somewhere? Jeff, our boy Jeff. Yeah, Brian, we got a question from Amar Rosman. Uh, first question he asked was just a newbie question: Why a rye helmet doesn't have an internal visor? Internal visors, good question. We get that question a lot. Um, actually, I lost Greg's audio there when I changed the channel. So I'm just gonna have you read the questions, Jeff. Um, basically, internal visors, um, it's kind of a cool, I guess, uh, function. A lot of people think, I don't have to wear glasses. Um, it's out of the way when I don't want it. You drop it down and I've got basically what, what you would expect glasses inside to, to, uh, to 
uh, reduce incoming light. The problem with internal visors is they're internal. It's hidden between the shell and the EPS liner, and it's taking up space, and this space in some cases can be up to three eighths, if not even a half an inch thick in order to hide that lens to go up and down so it doesn't get scratched or, or, or create noise. So they have a fairly large pocket uh, to hide it. And that's up in the forehead area, which is the most common place to have an impact, is the forehead area, because you're going forward, and when you crash, you tend to go forward. So taking away any EPS or energy absorbing material from the inside of the helmet, in our opinion, is a bad thing. You're taking away the ability for the helmet to absorb impact energy. And since you have a very limited amount of material, about an inch and a half, to absorb whatever energy might hit you in an impact, taking away a third of it in a critical area is not our idea of a protective advancement. It might be convenient, you might like it, you might want to do it because it's so, con you know, again, convenient, but it takes away from the helmet's number one function, which is absorbing impact energy. Secondly, you've got mechanical uh, components inside operating that lens. So you've got metal components, gears, cams, springs inside the helmet, again, taking away material and interjecting objects that might make contact with you inside the helmet. So anything you can do to keep those things away from your head, your eyes, your face, increase the capacity of the helmet to absorb impact energy. Uh, again, knowing you don't know how much energy you're going to have to deal with, knowing that the helmet only has a limited amount of space to do all that work, our goal is to put as much protection between you and whatever might hit uh, that we can. So job one is always protection. Our eyes never going to have the latest, greatest, sexiest bells and whistles or aer aerodynamics or style, but rest assured, everything in an eye helmet was designed for job one, which is protection and everything else. And we think our helmets look pretty good. Ventilation is incredible, um, but it's designed for a purpose, and that purpose is not to interfere with the helmet's ability to protect you in an impact. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> and then uh, same, answered, same gentleman. Answered my question. <laughs> same, same gentleman's second, or second question. Um, there's new technology called MIPS. What is Arai's opinion on this? What would Arai consider to integrate it? Uh, so well, hold MIPS, on, before you answer that question, what, what is MIPS? I don't know MIPS. MIPS is a uh, technology that was, I believe, developed by an independent company for bicycling, bicycle helmets. And it's an internal, and again, I don't know 100% about it. I don't know the details. If I get it wrong, forgive me. I'm going to kind of just 10,000 foot it. Um, basically, it's an internal shell that is put inside the liner and offers some ability of rotation. So in an impact. Oh, okay. I've seen that, yeah. Or an oblique impact or a siding glancing impact if the helmet rotates a little bit. MIPS, I believe, is designed to let the helmet rotate with your head not rotating. So your head will slide inside and not succumb to that rotation. And then there's some limitations to how far that uh, rotation avoidance you get. And having said that, when you look at an awry helmet, it's round, smooth, and strong. The external shape of that helmet is designed to avoid catching on an obstacle. Uh, so we have a round smooth shell, no hard edges molded into the shell that might catch an edge that might one, stop the helmet momentarily that might send energy into the helmet. Since we have a limited ability to absorb energy, we don't want to introduce any energy that we don't have to. So we try and avoid it as much as possible. Our extremely smooth and strong shell, strong, it doesn't deflect and also catch an obstacle and smooth. So as you hit the ground, you'll glance off smoother, you'll slide much more freely and you're avoiding all of that potential rotation and all of that potential energy going into the helmet as long as possible. So as you slide, you're continuing to avoid the rotational energy. As you tumble and roll, the helmet is constantly trying to avoid snagging, stopping or rotating. So because our helmet is a smooth 360 ball, as you go through that process, you're constantly avoiding all of those energy potentials. If you put something internally into the helmet that is designed to try and deal with the energy once it's inside, it's pretty hard to deal with energy once it's inside. And it's also hard to deal with something when you have a limited, to, limited amount of range to deal with. So if you have a rotational device inside that can only go three quarters or an inch, 
and then it stops, you're just delaying the inevitable. A quick little impact and a quick little uh, rotation, fine. But if it's something that grabs and really tugs, you've got about an inch of play and then it stops working and now you've got to deal with that energy. You've just delayed, in my opinion, the inevitable. So a rise philosophy is avoid it. Don't let the energy in. And the I mean, place. and every crash is different, isn't it? Every single crash is different, Brian. Crash and that's different. really the, you know, the, the, the hill to climb in terms right. of head protection. You never know where it's coming from, what speed, what angle, how much energy is involved. So designing a specific internal aspect of the helmet to deal with pretty much one thing, it's great if it's that one impact. If you take that impact in that way that they designed it for, it's awesome. You're going to get great performance. But if you've got a different impact that doesn't have anything to do with that design, you may have taken away some of the helmet's ability to deal with that other impact. Um, in order to put something in the helmet, you have to take something out. You have to make room for it. So you're taking away, again, that limited capacity. So our goal is keep all the potential energy out as possible, as much as possible, before it finally gets inside. And what does get inside, we have the maximum amount of internal liner thickness to deal with whatever can get inside. And that's our key, is to maximize every aspect. So if we want to avoid rotation, don't let it inside. Round, smooth shell. If you want to avoid rotation, round, smooth, strong shell. Internally, our liner, mm -hmm. EPS liner, as your helmet, if it does rotate, your head will push into that EPS as it rotates, and it will crush, and it will offer some absorption of that rotation. Our headliner is snapped into the EPS at four points. It also has a little bit of float. So it will also add a little bit of rotational absorption, if you will, and let the helmet slide before it interjects some of that rotation. So all of these things working together give uh, an awry rider a bigger arsenal of all these things that can deal with direct impacts, glancing impacts, front side angle, big or small. Basically, we have no idea what you're gonna do. We have no idea how to deal with everything, but we do everything we can to give you the best possible outcome in any given scenario. So we don't like to mess with it. We don't really uh, embrace a lot of new technology. We're always looking for it. But Arai developed a shell and a liner performance package that works so well together that anything we introduce to it now may mess that up. And we don't want to mess it up because we've had incredible success for the last 30 years. Mr. Arai was awarded an FIM award uh, for bringing rider protection. Um, the first in a safety uh, uh, rider safety gear department. So Arai was chosen as a helmet manufacturer. Uh, Mr. Arai was chosen as an individual for enhancing rider protection for a helmet. When there are other companies that do leathers, boots, gloves, helmets, air suits, airbags, all these other things that are even closer to the FIM and possibly have a, a more ongoing relationship, but they chose Arai. Uh, as a standalone helmet from Japan to award this first award to. So they recognized the value that Arai brought, you know, 30, 40 something years ago when no one else was really thinking that hard about those things. So it's remarkable uh, how early we had that uh, potential, how good we were back then. And things have gotten a little narrower, things look a lot better, you know, it's a lot harder to, de to determine the difference of helmets but I think we still have a huge advantage over the others simply because of the direction we started in and Mr. Rice's focus of staying in that direction. Now, Brian, let me ask you this um, shelf life of a helmet. So, you know, I've heard for years that, um, you know, you, you, you shouldn't put a helmet on that's over five years old or it, it, what is a rise recommendation for, uh, you know, a helmet that you currently have and a rye helmet, because obviously I'm speaking specifically of a rye in terms of like, you know, this helmet here is, what 20 years old i guess maybe mm -hmm. something like 22 years old what is the recommendation for that for a helmet age yeah and, it, and it's a good point everything we talk about is always about a rye some reference yeah. is general but for the most part everything we say i don't apply it to anyone else as i apply it to a rye so when everyone you know takes that that what we say understand that um we basically take we used a five-year uh, window that Snell uh, came up with. Snell actually recommends a helmet be replaced after five years of use. And my understanding of how that evolved, and I don't know the 100% the story, is that they took some time ago 
two identical helmets and took one out of the box and put it on the roof of the building uh, to be out in the elements, the sun, the rain, or the rain, no snow there in California. Um, and then <laughs> they had somebody ride its, its, its twin uh, for that amount of time, normal riding experience. And then after I believe a certain period of time, I'm not sure if it was a full five year or not, they tested the two helmets side by side. And they found that the one that was on the roof tested almost to the letter or to the number that it was designed for. Whereas the one that was ridden in tested less so. It wasn't as uh, good. And they took that as, okay, a brand new helmet that was, even if it wasn't stored properly, but a brand new helmet that wasn't used actually tested pretty well. It held up to the elements and it tested really well uh, after X amount of years. The one that was ridden in that was warm and suffered uh, abuse, you know, sticking it on a mirror on your handlebar end, hair products, not being clean, sweat, salt uh, in your sweat, pollution, all those things, washing it out and cleaning it out, all that abuse is actually what made the helmet perform less than it was designed for. So as the helmet gets loose and sloppy, in an impact, it actually has some slight movement and it, and it didn't test as well. And that's another reason why you don't wanna wear a helmet that's too big. If a helmet slips on your head like a bedroom slipper, it's too big, it needs to be snug and firm to perform really well. But for a helmet lifespan, brand new helmet out of the box, even an older helmet is gonna perform as it was designed. However, that's a single instance. If you buy a 10 year old helmet that had a Snell standard, you know, two Snell standards ago, every five years, they introduce a new standard, give or take. So if you bought a 10 year old Arai Snell helmet that was two Snells back, it's gonna perform really well to that standard it was designed for 10 years ago, but it will do it now. Put it on your head, great. And as of Greg, if you can't get more than 17 minutes before wadding a helmet, you know, you're probably pretty good. <laughs> the problem is if you wear that helmet, <laughs> the longer you wear that helmet, it's gonna to start to, your sweat's gonna get into it, it's gonna start compressing the liner, and the foams and the glues and the plastics have dried out over the years uh. of just being in storage. And people have told us, yeah, I got this helmet, I pulled it out of storage and I'm getting these black particles on my shoulder. I'm like, it's black dandruff. The liner is starting to crumble and it's starting to shed and the helmet just starts to break down just from sheer age. So while it performs really well initially, as you use it over time, it's gonna to start to break down, get sloppy and just fall apart. So we always rec recommend get a helmet as, as, as new as possible. Uh, our warranty period is five years from first use or seven years from date of purchase or of manufacture date. So we give a helmet two year window from manufacture to getting to you in the distribution system to try and give it a little bit of time. So you get a full warranty, five year warranty, uh, and they perform extremely well um, You know, within that seven years. I've had people return helmets that they've been using for 10 years religiously. Some are dirtier than others. Some are more worn than others. Some are beat <laughs> up, but it's amazing the good condition that they they are still in even after 10 years. So I've seen a rise exceed the performance values that we suggest you replace them at. So I suggest five years of use is when you should start evaluating whether your helmet needs to be replaced. Is it worn out? Would replacing the liner and cheek pads give it more life? Have I pounded the EPS liner on a mirror? Um, is the shell damage cracked fading? Are the plastics getting brittle and, and coming apart? You know, a helmet doesn't have to be replaced in five years, but it's a good idea to do that if you can. If it, you want to get some more life out of it, that's totally up to you if you feel comfortable. If it's nice and firm, it doesn't move around, it's not noisy, it's not distracting, it's not, you know, a, a hindrance or a danger to you while you're riding. Ten years, you know, that's pushing it. I mean, the new standards come along, they demand more of the helmets. New technologies, new shell materials. <clears throat> Even in between Snell standards, Arise constantly evolving and improving our shells, you're always going to get better performance. So it's not uh, by any means a, a, a small price to pay to upgrade when you think your current Arise is in great shape, but it's in your best interest to avail yourself of the latest technology because we, all, we are always improving. Even if it looks similar to your previous Corsair, the new Corsair is better than the older Corsairs. We're always trying to make them better. It's a consistent pursuit of a gains in protection. So it's a mouthful, consistent pursuit of gains in protection, but that is actually the, 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 the mantra that, that Arise speaks. We're constantly trying to improve whether anyone asks for it or not, whether it's required or not. We're always looking to improve the helmet, whether you can see it or not. So 
you know, replacing a helmet, it's never, it's never fun because a lot of people, they get really attached to their helmets. They love them. It's their baby. It fits them like, you know. Uh, well, a, it's a fun if you have new paint schemes and stuff and new features. I mean, I, it's yeah. totally fun. I, I, I mean, of, I, I know what you're saying, though. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I get a lot of people well, like, give I mean, look, like, Brian, we've been at this thing for like an hour, right? Yep. So I appreciate you answering that question, but I do want to share a couple extra things with you real quick. Okay. okay? One of them is this helmet that I have, this moto helmet that I have, and this is the the VX Pro. I believe this is probably one of the originals. Yep. And for those of people that recognize it, this is the Nikki Hayden replica. And this was from my two wheel Tuesday days when Nikki came in to the studio. And Nikki, of course, is, you know, 2006 Moto GP world champ, and he's since passed away. But unfortunately for me, a little bit's faded, but this is one of my favorite helmets, the one I have moved around quite a bit over the years. And a little bit of the signature is faded off, but this is a good one. But I do have something that I want to bring up, okay? That's interesting that I'm not even sure, Brian, if you know. But mm. have you seen the new Jim Connor video that was released with Travis Pastrana yesterday or day before? Have you had a chance to look at it yet? No. Dude, it's sick. Well, here's an Arai helmet that a lot of people don't know I have because I only used it one time. You recognize this one, Brian? Oh, I do. I do. It's this great. is a car helmet, people. It's a car helmet. And I saw you guys just introduced a new um, a new helmet, uh, car helmet too. Little G-dub on the side. This was used, this helmet was used in a feature that I did for my old show, Two Wheel Tuesday, with Travis Pastrana. And we actually went to uh, South Carolina to Michelin's Proving Grounds. This is when he was supported by Michelin. And we did a bunch of car stuff with Travis uh sliding and skidding and 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 all kinds of stuff and it was so much fun and we got this and now to look at like where travis is in a car and his rally stuff is pretty sick but um this is one helmet that i think actually yeah travis because we got done and i knew it was kind of a one use a one use deal for me i actually you can see a little bit of green it's it's tough yeah. with the lights that yeah. i have overhead in my house here but there's travis's signature right yep. there and uh, I use this a little bit for some go-kart riding and stuff like that. But yeah, this is uh, a lot of people don't know. I actually have an Arai car helmet as well. Yeah. Same great, great technology. You can see it's such a different field of view in a car helmet and a little bit in the design for a specific reason. But there you yeah. go. A little something for you there, Brian. Yeah. yeah. I, I watched Travis do Pikes Peak, the hill climb, and it's incredible how good he is on four wheels. I mean, it was one scene where he's drifting it up the mountain and, you know, Giving a peace sign or a thumbs up to the to the cameras while he's while he's doing it, and it's not a it's not what I would consider the safest uh, uh, event, um, but he, he's remarkable. And it's Travis, yeah, it's Travis Pastrana. What's safe? Like, yep. You know, what does safe mean to him? Yep. You know? And and while it wasn't official, we had a, a brief relationship. Um, Arai was the first helmet to do a double backflip uh, on a motorcycle. Um, so it, it, it has since moved on from that, but it was kind of a cool. Uh, time and experience that we had at, at those times but uh yeah we do auto helmets as well we get a great feedback from our auto race program a lot of that technology goes into our motorcycle helmets because formula one drivers are a whole nother level of picky and paying attention to fine detail so we've learned a lot from formula one um and it's 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 had a huge advantage years ago i used to think it was a drain on our resources but it's been a huge advantage to r d so Arai really does use racing at all levels as an r d and everyone benefits from it even in the motorcycle side so it's remarkable how Arai has been able to, 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 to put all that together and make a better helmet, both on four wheels and two. So it's pretty cool. And it's cool. I, I forgot well, I just, that, but I do remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you guys for the years of protection. I mean, I have hit the deck too many times. And for those times that I haven't, you know, that I haven't crashed, because there's been plenty of hundreds of thousands of miles that I've ridden over the years where I haven't, just having an Arai on my head and the feeling that it gives me the confidence uh, that it gives me knowing that I'm well protected, you know, yep. is is great. And I just want to thank you and and your entire staff and and all the staff that's worked for Arai over the years. Not a lot of turnover because you guys have a really good company and and everybody who's worked for Arai has believed in your product. And I understand why. So thanks for all the the support over the years and protecting me because now I get to use this massive level of <laughs> intelligence that I never lost on commentating motorcycle racing and having a podcast. Yep. where I get to talk all kinds of fun stuff with about motorcycle racing now, and, we, and get we, crushed. And we appreciate you, you as well. And we, we often talk about, you know, if you've never used an Arrive for what it was intended for, it's still going to be the best helmet you've ever had. You know, just it's 
it's a great companion that lets you enjoy the ride more. And we're glad that you're, you know, you're where you are and are able to use that database um, that is growing in, in inside your dome there. So that's awesome. We yeah. do appreciate that. <laughs> we do appreciate that. And look, the and look there, there's, there's hopefully an end in sight or, or at least a recovery in sight for COVID. And I can't encourage people enough. I do it on the podcast every week uh, because Arai supports the podcast is get down to your dealership and get properly fitted for a helmet and really sample an Arai helmet. Put it in your hands, put it on your head and give, give it a try. And I'm telling you, you're going to be convinced because the, the, the quality level is unlike anything in the industry. Yeah. And, and we always tell people, what do you got to lose? If a dealer has one, you want to try it side by side, give yourself the opportunity to try it on. We find that fitting it side by side, comparing, we shine. If you get the right size and the right shape, I, I think even if you can't buy it today, plant a seed, think about it. And at some point in the future, you want to consider trying an Arai because there is quite a bit of a difference uh, in the experience. Again, even if you never crash in it, you're still going to enjoy it better than I think any other helmet. So, yeah, for sure. But that's a biased, you know, comment for me. I've worked for Arai <laughs> for a long time, so. But uh, but again, we yeah. do appreciate you coming on. I do appreciate. I'm, I'm, I think some of your uh, professionalism is rubbed off. I let you talk quite a bit, and you did let me talk, so that makes me feel better. Um, I got it out. <laughs> uh, but I do appreciate it. Uh, and I, you already did plug. You want to plug the podcast. When is your podcast? When does it usually go on? Uh, we normally post Wednesdays, uh, a new one each week. And we're talking, you know, primarily about road racing. But we'll dip our toe into other things, especially during the wintertime, like when Supercross starts. Um, we have done the podcast. We've done 104 episodes uh, mm -hmm. over the, the couple of years that we've been in existence. It's Greg's Garage Pod with co-host Jason Pridmore. You can look for that. Um, we normally, what we've done actually to partner with Arai is during the Supercross season, we will do a fantasy league in conjunction with some of the other fantasy leagues out there. And when you join our league, we the winner has won an Arai helmet the last two. So we did it for Supercross, and then we just wrapped up our uh, MotoGP um, pool, I guess mm -hmm. you could say, for our, our league or whatever for fantasy. And so we're going to continue on with that as well. So it's worth a listen. Greg's Garage Pod with co-host Jason Pridmore. It's Jason and myself. We do tons of interviews. We have guests on there from uh, Cameron Bobier, and we have um, you know I industry insiders. We have MotoGP riders. We have World Superbike riders. We just have a, a, a ton of content out there. And so you know, if you're into podcasting, just give it a try, and uh, you'll hear a little awry. You know, uh, awry news is what we've what we've dubbed it at this point. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of cool and. Uh, it keeps Jason and I, Pridmore, connected to the industry when racing isn't going on and connected to the fans as well. So it's gotten um, a good reception and people are really enjoying it, especially because Pridmore just crushes me constantly. So, you know, if you want to hear me take it a take a beating, <laughs> go check out the podcast. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we appreciate that very much. And uh, I guess we will cut it off. We're just over the hour minute and see if anybody survived that long. Hopefully uh, they were interested enough. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone for, for dipping in and checking it out. We appreciate it. Thank all of you that are going to watch this when it's not live and, right. and tune in, check it out. And don't forget to share it with all your friends yep. and don't forget to smash that subscribe <laughs> button on Arise channel and, we'll and comment. <laughs> Those yeah, always help. We'll do comments and we'll put links in the description. I don't know exactly what all we can do, but we'll do that for the future. But uh, we appreciate it, Greg. Thank you very much. And on the YouTube channel, Thanks, we Brian. have our, our previous uh, shows. If you guys want to go check them out, there's some interesting uh, uh, guests on that as well. And hopefully we'll get some cool guests like Jeff get uh, that uh, Greg gets on his show uh, from MotoGP. We have a couple of guys we know. We'll have to see if we can uh, get them on our show. Dude, get Iogora on. I want to meet that dude like you have no idea. That's that's a, a podcast thing. Iogora, my I'll, favorite. I'll, uh, I'll give it a shot. All right, man. Thank you very much, and we'll uh, we'll chat later. Thanks, everyone. See you.